Hello and welcome to Farm Connections. I'm your host, Dan Hoffman. On today's episode, we head to the University of Minnesota Landscape Arboretum in Shaska for Farm at the Yard, their new installation promoting agriculture. Joanne Lauer visits with us to tell a new tale about her memories of her father, and the University of Minnesota Extension brings us a new best practice. All here today on Farm Connections. Welcome to Farm Connections with your host, Dan Hoffman. Farm Connections made possible in part by Alcorn Clean Fuel, a farmer-owned renewable energy producer in Claremont, Minnesota for more than 20 years, producing ethanol, high-protein livestock feed, and corn oil for resale to benefit its members and their communities. Absolute Energy, a locally owned facility, produces 115 million gallons of ethanol annually. Proudly supporting local economies in Iowa and Minnesota. Absolute Energy, adding value to the neighborhood. Back in 1944, Sam Bauer had a vision to provide tires and heating oil to families. This second and third generation family run business is still focused on commercial truck, retread tires, tires for your passenger vehicles and farm equipment too. Novel Energy Solutions, committed to working with farmers and landowners to deliver a new crop, electricity. More about income potential and lease agreements designed to be top performers at NovelEnergy.biz. Farm Connections traveled to Chaska, Minnesota, home of the Landscape Arboretum from the University of Minnesota. And with me is the director, Peter Moe. Peter, welcome to Farm Connections. Oh, I'm cl glad you're here today. Thank you. Well, this is a fantastic event. There's people, there's food, there's good weather, there's a lot of nice plants. What's happening today? Well, we're opening the farm at the Arb. This is an exciting day for the Landscape Arboretum. You know, we're part of the University of Minnesota, the College of Food, Agriculture, and Natural Resource Sciences. This is where the apple and grape research and landscape plant research has happened for decades. But we're now starting to work with agricultural crops. We have this historic farm right here on the site, part of the Arboretum, with this amazing red barn and land. It's you know, small compared to modern day farms, but we can still show a variety of crops that are being grown and talk about what University of Minnesota research, how that's helping farmers to grow more food on the same amount of land while preserving soil and water. So it's, everybody's interested in how their food is grown, and we're demonstrating that here. For the first time, we've always done apples and grapes, but now we're doing corn and wheat and soybeans and oats and the full range of, of crops, and showing so many different ways that the the university research is helping farmers and how farmers are adopting new practices, whether it's cover crops or you know, some of these new perennial crops that are probably a little ways down the road, but other things like that. What a great way to connect or interface people with their environment and their food. It's yep. really great. That's exactly right. And the reason that the people are supporting this, we've got support from ag businesses, from the producer groups, from a lot of individuals, is that most people now live in the cities and suburbs, and they're, they're really not, they're removed from agriculture. But we're here right in Chanhassen, Chaska, right on the edge of the Minneapolis area, and people can, we have 500,000 visitors that come out to see our flowers and beautiful trees and all the other things we do, but now they can come out and learn, they still see those things, but learn about agriculture, and there's so many things happening all the time. It's, a, it's an exciting field right now. There's so many new innovations, uh, new things that farmers are adopting, and it's, it's, it's very exciting and really interesting to people. Well, it certainly is, and the energy yeah. today is good, very good. I hope that that 500,000 visitors a year doubles within five years and well, to a million. That would make us all very happy because our staff works so hard. We've got just an unbelievable staff, a horticulture staff that design gardens, uh, uh, people that work in the na native areas. We have the restored prairies and wetlands. Our education staff, we don't do, we're part of the University of Minnesota, but we don't do a lot of credit courses, but we do everything else. For pre, we have pre-K programs, we have school field trips, summer camps, and then a whole wide range of adult classes. Classes, and also classes for professionals on things like schoolyard gardens or green, uh, green infrastructure, rain gardens, and how to, how to absorb more stormwater. We do all these different programs here, and, the, and we have just great staff, but when we also have great access to University of Minnesota resources. We're part of the U. So with the faculty and our college, as well as extension educators are here all the time. And we have, we're currently, the, we're the state headquarters now for the Master Gardener program, which gives us uh, 
great breadth across the whole state of Minnesota because that program is in virtually every county. It's, it's based here, but we, so we do the training here and some of the you know, policies and things, but each county is running their own master gardener program. And and so, but the information from here is then spread across the whole state. Well, Peter, as I listen to your comments, I think about, as I'm an educator as well, it seemed like whenever we could connect students to the natural environment, their senses were awakened and it was easier to teach. I, you're exactly right. I can tell that you've been a teacher because uh, that's what we, one of the great things about the Arboretum. We, when the school field trips come out, even in the winter we have access to a greenhouse, but in the fall and spring, they're not in the building very long. Because why would you be when you have these, all these environments? We can take people into a sphagnum bog. We can take them into the big woods and learn about maple syrup. We can take them out on the prairie. Or other things completely unrelated, a Japanese garden or a, a home demonstration garden where they can learn about different types of landscaping. And be able to talk to kids, get them involved, hands-on stuff, right with the plants right in front of them, or working directly with the plants, that, that's, that's a win-win for everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. And when we think about this site, someone has had some foresight and visioning to say, let's carve out, let's sequester a spot where we can teach, learn, have a natural environment, and have outreach. Because we're pretty close to the metro area that's mm -hmm. probably wanting to gobble this up. <laughs> so we need to have policy and legislative support, correct? That's right. We've, been, we've grown to 1,200 acres. And part of the, the most recent parcels we've purchased have been with support from the LCCMR, the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, which is lottery funds. And we've, been, we've matched many of their donations. It's not really donations. It's funding for conservation. We've matched those with private gifts and have enabled us to grow from uh, 25 years ago, we were at about 600 acres, and now we're, now we're 1,200. And so we preserve native woods. We've got new areas uh, right here to, to do a farm demonstration. Other areas we're keeping for future plant collections. We need to expand our, there's always new plants uh, available that we want to show people. And you know, with things like the emerald ash borer coming to Minnesota, all of a sudden something the Arboretum's always done is have diverse collections of trees from all over the world are really even more valuable because people are thinking, well, which, I don't want to plant an ash tree now, so what should I plant? And we, well, we, we, can, we can show hundreds of different examples here. Things that are adapted for Minnesota. You can read a book about trees, and unless that book is really written by an author familiar with the growing conditions in Minnesota, it might not be the, exactly the information you need. Because we're in such a cold part of the country, gardening and agriculture have adapted to do things a certain way in Minnesota that, you, that would be different from other places. Well, speaking of the emerald ash borer, monoculture, because you have so many compared to the diversity you have here. That's right. But one of the two of the first trees that were planted when the Arboretum started in 1958 were a shellbark hickory and a ginkgo. And those are still not very, well, ginkgos are getting more common, but still the hickories are not very common, but they should be planted more. The, the shagbark hickory is native in the Mississippi River Valley, right up to Red Wing. The perfectly hardy tree here in, in the southern half of Minnesota, but rarely planted. And that's just one example that we all need to be planting a variety of trees. If you and your neighbors and their city parks department are all planting Ohio buckeyes and different species of oaks and lindens and honey locusts, and we'll have both uh, be more beauty, but also much more uh, resistance against a single pest that can do so much damage. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, people in our community, consumers, can come forward and look at the trees here and you have a lot of nice labels so they can say, I like that tree or I don't like this one, correct? That's right. That's what an arboretum looks like a park in some ways, but it's not really a park because all of our plants are cataloged in a computer database and mapped with the GIS software and uh, we can produce maps and, and interpretive information that right now it's not all available on your phone or on a website, but it, it, we're working towards that as a goal. And, and the signage that you mentioned is really valuable. When I travel to other arboretums, especially in warmer climates or other countries, I would like to go to Botanic Garden on the first or second day, especially if I'm leading the group because I don't know the plants <laughs> and labels are really important. <laughs> Yeah, what are the features, what are the benefits of certain plants, wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, more than just the name, that's right. Because what's, is this good for sun or shade or how big does it get? You know, those, those are pretty important questions. Very much, especially in an urban environment where they might be planted. That's right. Well, you mentioned something about this particular site and, of course, the iconic barn behind us, yeah. the iconic red barn, mm -hmm. how beautiful that is. And I know you're using it in some of your promotional work. Yeah. How did this come to be? Somehow there had to be a vision and then someone saying, this was our farm, we'd like it to be used in a certain way. 
I think what really was one of the big changes is just the consumer interest in how their food is grown, which you guys are providing information on that all the time. Uh, we hadn't really done that much. We've done cooking classes and stuff. And we do a lot with vegetables and, and quite a bit with fruits, but broader field of agriculture, not so much. And so we had several trustees on our board that were working for General Mills or Cargill. And we even have some people that are, have uh, uh, farm backgrounds. And so we all started thinking, you know, we're part of the College of, of Food, Agriculture, and Natural Resources. We have this land, a farm that was, goes all the way back to the 1850s. None of those original buildings are here, but some Swiss immigrants uh, farmed here in 1850 and grew apples. They had beehives. They had a nursery. And, of course, they had cows and chickens, and like, like every farm did at those days. So that, we've got this great history. That farm then eventually was modernized to the barn you see today in the 1920s and uh, became a dairy farm for another 40 some years. And so we had the land, we had the barn, we had the University of Minnesota knowledge, we had interest of our, among our own members and visitors and our board of trustees. It was, all came together. And we, it, but we planned it for probably close to uh, almost 10 years. And so I'm glad we didn't just jump right into it. We maybe wouldn't have gone the right direction, but I'm really happy with the direction we're going today. Nice work. You yeah. mentioned communities and support. How has the farm community, groups like Minnesota Farm uh, Bureau or Minnesota corn growers or Minnesota soybean growers impacted what you do? Uh, they've been extremely valuable. They've actually supported our breeding programs for a number of years, but really got on board with this project. And of course, the financial support was valuable, but also we met with the uh, this, those same group, groups you mentioned, also Minnesota Wheat, and even some individual farmers. We had uh, like focus groups here and listening sessions and asked them, what kind of questions are consumers in your own city where you live asking you? And let's see if we can answer those questions here. So it's both the financial support, but also that these are the real things farmers are, are dealing with. These are the, are the decisions that farmers have to make every year or even more often than that. And so we're hoping we can answer some of those questions or show, let consumers know what's really involved in modern farming. You've come a long way. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. Love the barn, love the interface with farmers yeah. and consumers and community members. Mm -hmm. What's in the future? Well, we'd like to continue to evolve with the inter what we're interpreting here. We'd like to talk a lot more about technology in agriculture. And uh, what, you know, one of our donors is uh, on the board of John Deere Company, and he tells me about this, some of this new equipment that farmers are buying that can recognize individual weeds and only treat that individual weed. Uh, it, it, you know, everything's tied to the global positioning. It's fascinating. And I, I think that, when, I think if people come here, especially maybe high school kids and learn, if farmers are using this technology, they might be interested in, in a career in farming, or, to, or especially with the technology side. So that's just one thing. And then these new crops that are coming along, they're, you know, they have a ways to go. The, this Kernza, that's an intermediate wheat grass, it's a perennial grass, it has a grain, very good for soil conservation. The crop needs to be, it needs to be evolved a little more. But then there's some other crops too that have valuable oil seeds. Uh, people have never really heard of them, and but some farmers are planting them. They, a lot of them are good for plants for pollinators as well. And so we're showing some of those here. And then of course, even the crop plots will change every year because farmers are doing different things. And we wanna, you know, we're not maybe gonna show the brand brand newest thing, but we wanna be up on that we're kind of mirroring what's happening in agriculture across Minnesota. Peter, thank you very much for the interview. Great work, I wish you the best in the future. What a nice capstone project to 44 years as director. Well, thank you, Dan. And we'd love to have you come back in the future and see how the farm at the Arb is evolving. Well, we hope to. Stay <laughs> tuned for more on Farm Connections. Farm Connections, best practices brought to you by This is Brad Carlson, Extension Educator with the University of Minnesota Extension. Welcome to today's best practices segment. Today we're going to talk about fall tillage. There's been a lot of emphasis the last few years on nitrogen best management practices, but what a lot of farmers don't realize is that the university actually has tillage best management practices also. The first thing obviously you need to think about related to tillage is what was last year's crop and what's next year's crop going to be. But in addition to that, you need to think about why am I tilling? In a lot of cases, you're th simply thinking about what the seed bed is going to be like next year and the growing conditions for next year's crop, and so simply leaving the field in condition for that. But in other instances, you may be thinking about things like compaction, soil structure, 
and potentially you might be doing tillage to work in fertilizer or even a herbicide maybe in the spring. One of the key factors with tillage is we like to think about trying to leave at least 30% residue cover at the time of planting to prevent soil erosion. Obviously there's going to be differences in this based on how flat the field is as well as what the growing season is shaping up to be like, but this is kind of a rule of thumb to start with. In a lot of cases, if you have adequate drainage, you're going to be able to get away with less tillage. One of the reasons we do tillage is to have a warmer seed bed and more aeration for the time of planting. Obviously, this is also impacted by drainage. In a lot of cases, we find farmers using tillage simply as a surrogate for other problems, like poor drainage, or in some cases, it might actually be because of poor performance of your planter. Frequently, I'll ask farmers when they're talking about tillage, have they looked at their planter first? Because if they think they're getting a bad seed bed, bad seed placement, poor germination, in many cases the focus needs to be on your planter and not necessarily on the tillage implement. It's also important to remember that different soil types will behave differently based on the amount of tillage that you're performing. Obviously light soils, uh, sandy soils, places where we're closer to maybe a river bottom, but also as we move towards southeastern Minnesota where we have less soil types that are lighter, obviously are going to need less tillage uh, in order to have a, a dry, aerated, and warm seed bed in the spring. Your crop rotation is obviously the most important factor. In a lot of cases, if you're following corn with soybeans, Soybeans are a much more forgiving crop to the soil conditions when you're planting, and so it's also going to be a little bit more forgiving of what kind of tillage you leave behind. In a lot of cases, we're managing a high level of residue from the previous year's corn crop, and a lot of farmers do get concerned about whether that residue is going to interfere with emergence and with crop growth later in the season. Again, though, in the case of soybeans, uh, typically they are much more forgiving of this. It's the corn on corn situations which are probably a bigger concern in an area where you need to think of more about sizing your residue uh, as well as making sure that the, the top area in your seed bed is well aerated and, and darker in color to have it warmer and drier at the time of planting. In cases where we're following soybeans with corn, again the soil is going to be a lot more forgiving because the soybean residue that's left behind isn't covering as much of the soil as a corn crop residue did. A lot of the research done in Minnesota shows that actually a fall tillage application is unnecessary where we have soybean stubble. Probably the exception to this is our heavy, poorly drained soils, uh, areas that are quite flat. Lacustrine soils, particularly when you get south of Mankato in a lot of cases, do need to have some sort of tillage in the fall but much, uh, much of the rest of the state really doesn't need it. Tillage management is not an exact science on account of variability from one year to the next and one site to the next, but it is something we can work on and of course the potential for environmental uh, consequences is great depending on the kind of uh, precipitation we get in the spring. This is Brad Carlson, this has been our best practices segment, thanks for watching. What will become of my voice, Joanne? What will become of my voice? My dad asked me this question, hoping I would have an answer. For two years, he had been fighting cancer, leukemia, and now he realized he was not going to win. My dad, strong, handsome, and his voice was handsome too. It was a voice that could call the cows in from the pasture. It could welcome the neighbors or it could help me with my math. But mostly, I loved his voice when it was soft. And together, before I went to bed, we would together pray. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Out in the farmyard, it was a different story. His voice could be heard over the popping engine of the B. John Deere, who was a loud voice, a stern voice, a respected voice. 
I believe it was the honesty and sincerity in his voice and in his heart that made him a valued and trusted neighbor. For years and years, I remember him saving for a welder. He had wanted a welder for such a long time and finally after saving every cent, it came. The man, the dealer, came up the driveway with the new welder and his dad sat in, in the garage with, with the visor over his face, sparks flying. All the neighbors, I mean neighbors I didn't even know we had, came with their broken pieces of machinery. Dad would weld them back together as they stood out in a little circle in the driveway telling Norwegian jokes and talking about guy stuff. Dad never charged them a cent. Mom didn't like that. She said, Floyd, you need to charge them. And he said, Hazel, life just isn't about being paid. At church, at Bethany Lutheran Church on Sundays, I would sit between mom and dad. Mom who sang beautifully, dad, who made almost no noise at all. He had a bad singing voice. He couldn't carry a tune. Until one Sunday, there was a song introduced into our church that he didn't mind if everyone heard him sing, and he sang loudly, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. I think it was at Bethany Lutheran Church on Sundays when he was an usher. I think that's when he really would shine. He would take the collection plate down the row and, and he would say good morning to everyone as he passed the plate, which really made my mom embarrassed. You know, when you're Norwegian Lutheran, you're supposed to be quiet, don't you know? But I think that all those farmers in that congregation were happier when dad was the usher because they knew that he would never judge them if all they could put into the plate was noisy money. Well, he was only 59 and it was the week after Christmas, the saddest day when my dad died. But what's important is how he lived, how he loved his life, being a farmer, how he loved the earth. I think it's kind of funny how we come out of college sometimes, thinking we want to be someone big and important with letters behind our name. But to my dad, he realized it was the little things that matter, things like bedtime prayers and being a good and trusted neighbor. What will become of my voice, Joanne? Now I know. I am your voice, Dad. And that is amazing grace. While many have been predicting a major drop in land values with the low farm prices over the past several years, prices have remained relatively strong across the Midwest. It seems no matter what the conditions are financially in agriculture, there are always buyers and sellers for land to farm. Chuck Wingert is the owner of Wingert Realty and Land Services in Mankato, Minnesota. What we're seeing is high quality land still holding its value very well. Uh, if it has problems, triangulation, severance, uh, irregular shape, bad outlets, lighter soils, there's quite a discount. So, so far this year we've had uh, land values from 4,500 to 105. Just who are the buyers and sellers of farmland? Farmers wanting to expand on one hand and those getting out of farming on the other. 
but there are also some sales to raise equity due to the low farm prices. We are having some more debt issues where uh, even people that were in good shape after six years of uh, declining commodity prices, even the people that are in good shape are, are starting to get some pressure. So we've had more debt sales that we, uh, than we did last year. Last year we only had three, and I think we've had five or six this year. Uh, buyers, we still are seeing the expansion farmers in good shape, uh, willing to step out and buy some ground. 65% of our sales have been to expansion farmers and the traditional 35% investors. And are the low prices having an impact on land sales? Wingert says they are, but there are signs of improvement. Hog prices are coming back up now, soybeans coming up, so that might change it. But Every, if everything holds the way it is, I think we'll stay stable. If it doesn't, we're going to see a little more decline. It's been a rough ride for agriculture price-wise over the past six years, but I think most people are surprised at the strength in farmland values. They continue to hold pretty strong across the region. This is Lynn Kettleson reporting. It's been a wonderful day here at Farm at the Arb at the University of Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. Until next time, thanks for watching Farm Connections.